senior scientist at Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He teaches a course entitled Physics for Future Presidents, and I've invited him here to join us this evening here on 93 uh, WIBC. Rich, thanks for being a part of the show. How are you this evening? Oh, I'm wonderful. Thank you for inviting me. And my thanks to letting us postpone you. We had one hellacious storm come through last week, just about the time you were supposed to be on air, and it did not stop until after 1 o'clock in the morning here, which would have been about 10 o'clock your time. So thanks I for letting me. I tell you, when I tell people here in California that my appearance on your show was postponed because of tornadoes, uh, they're, they're just shocked. It's, uh, <laughs> it really brings it home, even out here to California. Oh, it, it well, we it have was earthquakes, uh, you know, we have fires, but, but I'm glad we don't have tornadoes. That storm ran all the way from Chicago uh, down to uh, Shreveport, Louisiana, and it was just a red wall of rain coming, uh, coming across. It was terrible. But I tell you what, we're going we're gonna to talk about some other things this evening. Now, you've been doing this course entitled Physics for Future Presidents for over 10 years, and then you wrote the book. But tell me about this course that you do on, on campus. Well, uh, the, the physics course for people who are not scientists so it was originally called uh, just qualitative physics, and people were losing interest in it. They were uh, taking courses in astronomy or courses in geology. They, they have to take a physical, real, physical science course, but this course was dropping, and I, I looked into it, and I realized why. It was, it was not being taught properly. Physics, to me, is enormously important in the world. We live in a high-tech world, and I think of physics as the liberal arts of high-tech. You learn some physics, and you can understand what's going on. So many of the issues we have today have a science component, you know, whether it's global warming or whether it's satellites in space or even terrorism and counterterrorism. If you don't understand the technology, you can't really make a good decision. And if you don't understand physics, how do you understand the technology? Exactly. So I, I wanted to create a course that would prepare people for being world leaders. You have written a wonderful book. I bought the book, and that's how I found you. I finally got up to I've been reading this book for the better part of three months, and I thought, well, I'm just going to track this rascal down. <laughs> and, and then I found you, and I thought, well, I got you through your website. And uh, you'll notice that I, I was a belt and suspenders guy. I, I called you, which has happened to be your cell phone, and that was wonderful that you answered. And then I also sent you an email, and you responded right back. So you have the heart of a teacher. I can tell that right off the bat. It's a great joy to be a teacher. I mean, research, I do half my time is spent doing research, and research is really tough. Trying to add a little bit of truth to our enormous knowledge is really not so easy. But you go into the classroom, and if you do a good job, the students let you know right away. You can see it in their faces. It's, yeah. it's really a, 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 a wonderful profession. It, it is. All right. Now, Professor, tonight we're going to cover a lot of territory. I want to apologize to you ahead of time for the many different questions that we're going to have for you. But it's, it's not often we get the opportunity to speak with a physicist. So the questions might appear to be pretty scattered, but ultimately they're all going to tie together, okay? Well, I, you know, I, the fact is, physics touches almost everything. And uh, whenever I appear before a, a, a new group and they, they start listening to the answers, it's wonderful to hear the questions that come out because so much of our confusion in the modern world comes about because of, of simple scientific principles that are not well taught. Everything is physics. Um, I grew up as a plumber's son, and, of course, plumbing and electrical and all of the things that we use to heat and bring comfort to our home are based in physics. But... Here of late, we have been concerned um, with the whole thoughts of terrorism, and, and certainly science is involved in this. Most of us have the mental image of those two planes flying into the World Trade Center, and that's a good place for us to start. So uh, when I look at the 9-11 attack on the World Trade Center buildings, I've always wondered what really brought down the two towers. So from a physics standpoint, can you describe to me what the effect of the impact of the airplane's was and what the resulting fire was. What what brought down the buildings? I, I remember watching that on television and seeing the fire and expecting it would be terrible because of the people who were being burned and trying to escape. And then suddenly the buildings collapsed. And as soon as they collapsed, I said to myself, oh my, I did, of course. Uh, it, it was so obvious what happened. The next day I went to class. I wasn't teaching that day, but the next day I went to class and I said, Today, change of lecture, let's talk about what happened yesterday and explain to them why the buildings collapsed, how it happened. Uh, basically, almost everything was pretty obvious after the fact. I wish I had the foresight to recognize this was going to happen. I, I've subsequently tracked down at least two other professors at Berkeley who did the same thing, who explained how the buildings collapsed. And it, it occurred in a way that just was unanticipated. When you heat steel, it loses strength. 
You don't have to heat it very high. If you heat it to 600 degrees, that's enough for it to lose half of its strength. And it's not enough to soften it. It's not enough to melt it, but it loses its strength. The reason is simply that the molecules of steel are vibrating. That's what heat is. Okay. When you get something hotter, they vibrate faster. And so they expand. They push apart a little bit. That's why things get larger when they, when they heat. That's why you take a lid off a jar by heating it up, because it gets a little bit bigger. But when it gets a little bit bigger, those molecules are a little bit further apart. And that means they're not as strong. They're not as tied to each other as they were. So if you heat steel to just 600 degrees, then it loses half of its strength. Now, these buildings are designed with a big margin uh, of, of safety. Uh, the steel is designed to be twice as strong as needed to hold up the building above it. When the fire continued burning for anywhere from, from half an hour to, to an hour and a half, the steel heated up to 600. It was never designed for that. Nobody ever expected to have a jet plane land uh, in the middle of the building and have a large fraction of its fuel continue to burn. So it got to that 600 degrees. At that point, the steel weakened. It could no longer hold up the top. And the top part of the building came down uh, like a sledgehammer. It happens very suddenly. If you take a soda straw and squeeze it between your fingers, you'll discover... It, it gives great resistance, but when it goes, it just goes completely. There's no, once so it you're bubbles, so, okay. So if I if I get this right, then the fuel, the jet plane fuel, which is essentially kerosene, kerosene is burning at so many degrees uh, Fahrenheit or centigrade, brings the temperature of the steel up on the two floors that were involved in this, and that's right. then as that got soft, then it was just it just compressed, and then it was the bang 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 like a pile driver collapsing one floor on top of another. Exactly right. That was it? That was it. Man. And as soon as I saw in fact, one of the engineers of the building, when he saw it burning, recognized this would happen. And, and he tried calling them to get the firemen out of the bottom floor. He, he, he tried desperately to get in touch with them, but was unable to get through. It was one of the great tragedies that one of the engineers who designed the building saw that, knew it was going to happen, and could not get through. How could we possibly have designed a building to withstand that? Would we have to super insulate the steel? But even with a collision, would that not have blown the insulation off the steel? Couldn't we design a building to withstand this? I don't think we want to. I, I think events like this, we want to make sure they don't occur again. And I think we're, we've, we've done very well with that. There will not be any more building uh, airplanes, at least in the United States, flying into buildings in the United States. We've taken those measures. That makes a lot more sense than reinforcing every single building in the United States to take an airplane hit. Now, the planes that did hit, and as they went through, they did not. They they tried to steer the planes between the two. Now, there was a lot of thought about why somebody tilted the plane and and all that. I'm a pilot, and I think he was just missing his mark. But oh you, yeah, yeah, I think that's obvious. <laughs> yeah, is that what it was to you? Okay, because yeah, I thought I mean, here, here they are trying to hit the building, and as they're getting close, they're saying, "Oh my God, I'm going to miss." Yeah, and so they steer the plane at a steep angle, and and were able to do that enough to hit. But they, they yeah, I'm I'm sure that all right. Now, did the did the impact cause any damage? Uh, do you think to foundation or to any structural members no, that no, would have brought it down? No, no, whatsoever. The impact actually had very little impact. That airplane just doesn't have enough mass in it. Air, we think of airplanes as being heavy, but they're really not. They're thin shells uh, full of people, but a lot of the weight is in the fuel. Uh, airplanes don't have that much mass, and it, 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 it burst through the walls of the building. A lot of it spewed out the other side. Only a fraction of the burning really took place in the building, uh, but you didn't need much. Uh, so the impact itself, if you look at the old films, which I have over and over again, you'll see the building hardly shakes. The airplane comes bursting through, and the building doesn't shake. There's, but, but it left energy, all the fuel. The energy in kerosene has 15 times as much per pound as you get in dynamite. 15 times as much. When A we lot of people don't realize that, but it's 15 times as much. It's enormous energy in kerosene. What a great day. I get to talk to a physicist. A new friend, I hope. His name is Rich Muller. He's a scientist and an author. He's a professor of physics at the University of California at Berkeley, and uh, he's a senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. He's joining us here. Uh, he teaches a course and has for over 10 years called Physics for the Future or for Future Presidents. He's also written a book by the same name. But, Professor, thanks again for sharing your time with us. I've got uh, many more questions, but we've got a caller up here. I think I warned you that we might get one like this, so let's pull him up here. Kevin, thank you for calling. How are you? I'm 
doing all right. How are you guys? All right. Now, you had a question for the professor. Yeah, I just don't see how it's possible. This would be the first time in history that a high-rise building is brought down by fire. And just for example, the Empire State Building, when it was struck by an airplane, had negligible damage and had decades older technology. These, the, the World Trade Center buildings fell in this exact same manner. You can compare it video to video to videos that you can find on the Internet of controlled demolition. All right, Kevin, I, I told you I'd let you have your piece. Now I'm going to get the professor up here and let him take a swing at you. What do you think, Rich? Well, uh, the Empire State Building was hit by a really small airplane. There was not much fuel in that airplane. The, these, these, these planes were fresh from takeoff. They were filled with, with jet fuel. Uh, they were something like 70 tons per plane. Uh, and as I said, that has 15 times the energy of TNT. So it, it adds up to a huge amount of energy. We've never had a fire like that in a high-rise before. Never had so much energy being released. Uh, the idea that it was controlled, thermal, uh, controlled demolition, uh, you'd have to explain how they managed to start the demolition at exactly the level which the airplanes happened to hit when those airplanes were really obviously not under very good control, and then worked the way down as they did just as the building was falling, uh, demolishing it. I know there have been papers saying thermite was found at the source, right. but thermite is only aluminum and iron and oxygen. And I read that paper on thermite. It was so disappointing. I expected the paper would explain what other things give aluminum and iron signatures, and they didn't even say that. I, it just shows that sometimes very poor papers can leak through the peer review system. I the idea of a controlled demolition where you're hitting it, starting it at just the right place, it just, just, just is, uh, I, I think, Sometimes the physics is so obvious. Yeah, that, sometimes that these things will collapse when given that much energy. Yeah, sometimes the most obvious answer is the answer. Now, I want to continue on with uh, terrorism for just a second. Uh, what are your thoughts about the new scanners that they have at the airports? I, I hear about backscatter. Uh, can you comment on the amount of radiation and the effects over time? Um, I used to fly for a living. You know, there. You know, well, I, fl- I first experienced backscatter X-ray about uh, 25 years ago okay. when it was a, a proposed thing. I just stood up to one of these things. I calculated the doses. It was so negligible. You, you get more radiation by flying in the airplane than you get by, by sitting uh, by, by, by this backscatter thing. So the if, I fly, if I fly pro- seven or eight times a, a, a week as a professional, I don't have to worry about it? Well, I, I don't think you have to worry about that much radiation. Okay. But the backscatter is less than you get from being in the airplane. You get in the airplane, you're up where the more intense cosmic rays from space. Those give you more of a radiation dose. So if you're not worried about that, and I don't think you should be, okay. you certainly shouldn't worry about the backscatter x-ray. All right. Now, the wands that they use, of course, they're, they're, you, know, you get the rope a grope if you don't want to go through the, through the radiation uh, routine. They have these wands that they pass around your bodies. How do those wands work? What are they doing? What are they looking for? They're looking for metal. Okay, so how does and, that work? Uh, and, and what they do is they create a magnetic field that then a magnetic field moving past a piece of metal makes a little bit of current flow, which makes the metal into a magnet, and they can detect that. So that's what they're really looking for. If you wanted to sneak in with a totally plastic knife, uh, you could do that with the, with the metal detectors. However, that plastic knife would be seen in the X-ray backscatter machine. That's really the reason for doing this, because there are things you can slip on. The old metal detectors were great for standard weapons, uh, but if, if, if you have something more sophisticated, a, a knife that's made totally out of ceramic, for example, and these days you can even make guns out of ceramics, then the metal detector wouldn't catch those, which is why they're going to these backscatter x-rays. I don't want to scare you, but if you will do a search on a cell phone pistol, you will see that they have converted cell phones now to fire four rounds of twenty two caliber ammunition, and yet they pass the now they have discovered it of course and they know what to look for uh, under our cell phones but it's well, I, I think it's true that any truly sophisticated person who is deeply familiar with the system and that's like an intelligence agency they can pass through you're not going to catch them okay what we're trying to do is to cut out the the terrorist who is not super sophisticated um, and 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 who doesn't really know how the system works, it will it will suppress them, so they won't even try it, and and they'll probably get really nervous because they because this thing can detect so much. It's particularly useful if they don't know exactly how the detector works. If they All don't right. know if they if they don't have a way of testing it. All right, can you tell me what's going on with these ounces of fluids? We're allowed three ounces of fluids as carry-ons. 
You know, yeah. what's, what's well, the issue about the fluids, and just how much fluid would it take to cause damage inside an airplane? I don't believe any of these fluids could cause any serious damage in the air, airplane. I've looked into the chemistry and the physics of these fluids, and if you're going to assemble them in such a way, mix them on flight, what caused the, the worry was that you can, in principle, make an explosive out of these liquids that will not be detected by the current explosive detectors. Okay. And so there was a panic and an overreaction. The U.K., immediately reacted by saying, let's just eliminate fluids. I believe the U.S. did it just because the U.K. did it, and so we have to do it because they did it. I don't think the fluid law makes any sense whatsoever. Okay. You're listening to the voice of uh, Rich Muller. He's a scientist. He's written a book uh, called Physics for the Future Presidents, but he's also been teaching this course for 10 years. Rich, tell me about uh, the typical guy or gal that will come and take this class. Is it just somebody who needs a science credit, or is it, is it serious physics students? Well, initially, it was the students who needed a science credit and who couldn't get into the other classes. But then it changed as, as time went on. Um, I, I, I exchange emails with each of my students, and that's quite a job because I've been getting over 500 a semester. Um, and I, I learned a lot about them. They, they, many of them are afraid of physics, or they hate physics, usually based on some bad experience in high school. Um, but they take the course anyway. And they take it because... Their friends tell them, take this course. Even if you hate physics, even if you're afraid of it, you should take this course. They take it because they, I think they recognize it's important, that it's hard to understand what's going on in the world if you don't know basic physics. Now, I did open the course up to physics majors. Previously, they weren't allowed to take it because everybody considered it too easy for a physics major. Not true. Uh, the course, we talk about things that physics that is not covered in the physics courses. How does a nuclear bomb work? Yeah, we're going to get not- to that one. I promise <laughs> you, we're getting to that one tonight. Um, let uh, me ask you another question. Uh, yeah. in, in simple terms, tell me the difference. Be- we, we talk about an energy crisis, and yet uh, tell me the difference between energy and power from your perspective as a physics professor. Okay. Uh, power is simply how rapidly you use energy. It's like the difference between how many miles you go and how fast you get there. If you're using energy fast, that's power. Okay. Now, we have machines, uh, generators, that can generate so much power. They're not running out of energy because we have lots of coal, but they can't burn it fast enough to produce the power we need. So typically on a hot day, when all the air conditioners are running, all the factories are running, we're running out of power, the rate to turn that coal or that natural gas into energy. And, and that's what causes the, the brownouts and the, and the blackouts is, is we, we just can't produce it fast enough. Uh, we are running out of one source of energy, and this is energy for our automobiles. The United States, the, the reserves we have are very small. Most of our oil or a large fraction of our oil is now being imported. And, uh, and, and so that is a separate crisis. We're running out of energy of the liquid kind for use in automobiles, uh, which is why there's so much pressure to go to new technology automobiles, such as battery-driven automobiles. Uh, we're not running out of energy for the electric grid. Uh, there we have a power crisis because we can't burn the coal or, or, or the natural gas fast enough. We don't have enough machines to do that. Last Thursday it rained so hard that I was afraid we were all going to have to get on boats and float away from the center of Indianapolis. And I had a wonderful interview all set up with a professor by the name of Richard Muller uh, from the University of California at Berkeley. And I had to call him and apologize. And you know what? He's the most gracious guy in the world. He said, that's all right. He says, we'll sort of squeeze you in next week. And that's exactly what we've done. So, Rich, thanks for being patient and thanks for being a part of the show tonight. I hope your your tornadoes are well passed. Oh, so do we. They, and, what you know, afterwards they keep going back and looking at tapes and data and they keep adding more and more tornadoes. We started off with one or two and I think we're up to 11 now in Indiana. Hey, uh, in, in fact, estimates that the number of tornadoes have been going up is, is largely uh, based on that going back and, and finding, finding more data. Uh, in, in fact, um, uh, from a careful analysis of the data, the number of tornadoes in the United States has actually been going down for the last 50 years. Boy, am I glad to hear that. I thought I had a black cloud over the top of Indiana here. And uh, oh, well. and same thing with Missouri and, and Mississippi. Those were terrible tornadoes. Uh, yeah, they had some very big ones. All right, but now, not but, an unusual number. I mean, it was more uh, – the, the real problem was these large tornadoes happening to hit big cities. Yeah. And, and that's a freak occurrence that we hope will not happen again. Professor, we hear about fears of a portable nuclear device, that it can be moved into a highly populated area by one or two people, either in a footlocker or in a suitcase. My question to you, and I have carried this burden of a question around uh, for a long time, is a suitcase 
nuclear device possible. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the United States uh, developed a, a device that could be carried by one person. It was called the Davy Crockett Missile. If you look that up on the web, you'll see it, it was, it was uh, something that one person could carry around. What people miss, however, is that a small nuclear device uh, doesn't do as much damage as a big nuclear bomb. Uh, a small nuclear device like the Davy Crockett uh, was the equivalent of, of, of several hundred pounds of TNT. Now, that's bad, but it was not really significantly worse than you get by loading um, ammonium nitrate into a, a van, as was done for Oklahoma City. Right. I mean, a, a small bomb can do a lot of damage. Uh, it can be carried by one person, but not significantly more damage than filling up a, a van uh, with some explosive such as ammonium nitrate. All right, so it's possible. Oh, yes. All right. So whether it's a bomb or whether it's in a bomb or in a nuclear reactor, what's the difference between uranium and plutonium? Because I kept hearing at Fukushima where all the reactors were starting to come down, all of a sudden they were saying, well, there's the difference between uranium and plutonium. When it comes to nuclear reactions, what's the difference between those two? Well, uh, in, in, in a whole bunch of differences. In a the suitcase bomb, by the way, that we're talking about is something that required an utter genius and a huge laboratory to be able to fabricate. It's not something that can be done by a terrorist group. It was, was created by Ted Taylor, who was, who was an astonishing person even among nuclear weapons designers. He managed to get this really small thing, not the sort of thing that's, that's easily done. Uh, uranium uh, is relatively easy to make a bomb from. If you can purify it, and the purification process is enormously hard uh, because you have to separate out the good uranium from the bad uranium, and the differences are so minuscule that you require a huge facility to do that. Once you've done that, it's relatively easy to make a bomb. Uh, the uranium that's used in nuclear reactors is not enriched that much, and therefore, if you got the uranium from a nuclear reactor, there's no way you can make a bomb from it. It's simply not purified. It has too much of the uranium-238 in it. That's important to know, that uranium by itself is not particularly dangerous, can't be used as a weapon. You have to spend a huge facility to purify it. That's what's going on in Iran right now. I was just going to say, is that... They have systems right. to try to purify it. All right. Now, tell me what plutonium is, then. Is it, in, is it enriched uranium, or is it an in entirely different uh, molecule? Uh, co completely different. Okay. Uh, plutonium... You have to make plutonium. Plutonium does not exist in nature. You make it. It was discovered by Glenn Seaborg, who made it in the laboratory for the first time. But you make it in a nuclear reactor. Okay. So this, the danger is this is what's happening in North Korea. They have a nuclear reactor. They've been making plutonium. Then they extract out the plutonium, and they can make a bomb from that, which is what they've done. The right. bomb was something of a fizzle because it turns out to be very, very hard to make a bomb out of, out of plutonium. All right. Now, we, we hear about the Fukushima plants. We had five reactors within, oh, two square miles. And it appears that all of them, and I'm, I'm talking from ignorance, but I'm talking, I'm repeating what I have heard, that they have melted down. What does that mean, and how, how danger of, dangerous of a situation is that long term in the, on the northern coast of, of Japan here? Okay, a meltdown takes place. Oh, a nuclear reactor, which can't explode, still puts out heat. If that heat is not removed by boiling water or something like that, then the fuel becomes overheated and it melts. And that tends to concentrate the fuel, but it also releases a lot of the gases. And so as a result, radioactive gases were released. Long-term danger, there's very little long-term danger you know, in, in Fukushima. The amount of radioactivity was released was enormous, but over a limited area, and they did evacuate, and the estimates for how many people will die from that radioactivity, best estimate is somewhere between, oh, five and maybe 50. All right. Now, what does it do to the food sources? They obviously were using seawater. As soon as I heard they were using seawater, I knew they'd given up at that point. They were just trying to cool it off. But all that seawater is going back into the sea. Is it radioactive seawater? Oh, yeah, but the radioactivity of seawater is so much greater than the radioactivity they're putting into it that uh, seawater is full of potassium. It's full of, it has dissolved uranium in it. Uh, seawater is, is, is actually quite radioactive. The amount, if, when, when, when these materials uh, went into the seawater, and there, there was a short-term danger for any fish that were within 10 or maybe 10, 10, 10, 15 kilometers, that they 
would, would have higher levels of radioactivity. But most of that radioactivity actually was in iodine. It disappears with a half-life of only eight days. Most of that radioactivity is either gone or diluted to the level where it's way, way down compared to the uh, natural radioactivity of seawater. All right. People tend to forget that the world is radioactive, and I like to measure the radioactivity of places like Fukushima to the radioactivity that you get when you're flying in an airplane or just the radioactivity that you get just walking around during the day. So why... Um... All right. Well, they've scared the snot out of us, that's for sure. And I, I, I know, and I think that's tragic. And I think Germany canceling its nuclear program is just a big mistake. Uh, they, they say that this radioactivity lasts for thousands of years. It doesn't last for nearly as long as the ashes, the, the carcinogenic ashes from coal, um, which lasts forever. They, they, they never go away. So uh, I, I think this scaring people about the nuclear reactor at Fukushima, it's an economic tragedy. The human tragedy came from the tsunami and the earthquake. The voice you hear is... the 20,000 people killed there, and we're expecting a couple dozen, maybe, from the radioactivity of Fukushima. Nobody's saying those words because they're not scary, but, but those are the kind of numbers that you get if you really look at the calculation. How long will Chernobyl be radioactive? How soon before it will come back to uh, inhabitable? Is it, is it forever uninhabitable? No, it's inhabitable now. Most of the area is inhabitable now. Okay. Uh, the radioactivity already has died enormously. This radioactivity, once an atom explodes radioactively, it's, it's gone. And so most of the radioactivity is at the beginning. And there are, there are movies, and you can, you, it, it, people have visited the Chernobyl area, and the wildlife is flourishing there. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it was evacuated because people were fearing uh, the, the, the kind of cancers you would get uh, if people had stayed there. But, okay, it's been evacuated. They didn't evacuate soon enough, and the worst thing that they did is they, they didn't put any limits on the food that was grown in that area. Most of the cancers from the Chernobyl area uh, probably came about from the drinking of milk from cows that ate radioactive grass. Right. Most of that radioactivity is gone by this point, and it's fairly safe to move back there now. Rich, where is nuclear technology going? I read in the book, in, in this book that Rich has written, it's called Physics for Future Presidents, but I keep reading about pebble bed technology. <laughs> That's above my pay grade. What's the difference between pebble bed and, and graphite, which appears to be in all of the, of the nuclear reactors at this point? Well, uh, there are actually a whole bunch of technologies, and there's a lot happening in this field, and there's some new kinds of reactors that are very attractive. The big problem with nuclear reactors is that you have to put in most of your money to build them, and then the fuel is basically free. Uranium is so cheap that, it, that it, 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 you buy a kilowatt hour of electricity for 10 cents, and 1% of that goes into buying the uranium. So the fuel is really cheap. Nuclear power makes economic sense if you keep it, after you keep it going for 15 years or so, then you've paid back the investment, and after that, it's just free power. The, electricity, the, the uranium doesn't cost much. That big investment is the biggest issue, and, and what's happening now is people are designing reactors that can be built in modules. They're smaller, so you can start with a small nuclear reactor and then build another one. These are safer in every, every sense of the word. There's really a lot of new nuclear technology that could never have the kind of accidents that happened uh, even in Three Mile Island. Of course, in the United States, we could never have a Chernobyl because uh, that reactor was so far below our standards that it was just, just shameful that anybody would build a reactor like that. It, it's sort of like building a coal power plant where you dump all of your ashes into the city streets to get rid of them. It was just, just such a bad design. Yeah. But nuclear reactors now can be done in a very reasonable and cost-effective way. And, and uh, to many of us who are worried about our consumption of coal and of other fossil fuels, uh, nuclear should be a very very good alternative. You know, the fact that you're from California, I'm just shocked that I, I would not have expected that from you. I would have thought that you, uh, you know, politically, I hear nothing but bad news about nuclear. Scientifically, it just doesn't hold water. Well, the, the interesting thing is you talk to the scientists who really know about this, and they say, well, nuclear waste storage, nuclear dangers, and so on, they're not technical problems. They're political problems. It's the fact that so many people, like like Senator Harry Reid, have made a career out of scaring people about it. That's the problem. It's not a scientific problem. He talks to the politicians, and they say, I wish you scientists could solve the technical problems, because we know it's a technical problem, not a political problem. So everybody's 
putting the issue into the, the other hands. Uh, I've looked at this. I've been on official studies of nuclear reactor safety. I've looked at it in some detail. I've been an advisor. Uh, there is no technical problem. The technical problems have basically been solved. The biggest mistake that President Obama made, in my opinion, well, a big mistake that he made was in uh, basically closing down the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Facility, which was a perfectly adequate place to store the waste. Well, folks, I hope you're enjoying it. We've got a physics professor, and he's the real deal. His name is Rich Muller. He's a uh, scientist and an author. He's been teaching this course called Physics for Future Presidents. I picked it up as a book about a year and a half ago, and I started pounding my way through it. And then I thought, well, this guy, we've got to get him on radio because he's just a lot of fun. And, uh, Rich, you have done just that. Thanks for being a part of this. We've got a fellow who's got a question. In fact, we've got a couple calls. Let's go ahead and grab these calls real quick. We've got uh, John from the northwest side. Hi, John. How are you? Oh, just fine, just fine. Rich, I want to ask you a question. Both of these planes hit at maybe uh, the 60th or the 70th story of the building. Now, had they hit a higher, I don't think the band, I don't think the building would have, would have pancaked like it did. But they hit the 60th or 70th floor, and they came down, and they pancaked. And it just seems to me like this was really well organized. They didn't hit at the bottom. They didn't hit at the middle. But they hit, you know, like two-thirds of the way or one-third of the way down. And I just wonder what you think of this. What do you think, Rich? Yeah, okay. I, first, I, I don't think there's any evidence that Osama bin Laden had any idea that these buildings would collapse. And the tapes that we have from him and so on, uh, it came as a big bonus. In fact, it, it was probably more than he wanted because uh, if he had killed a few hundred people, it would have been horrific and maybe the U.S. would have withdrawn from the Middle East. But uh, killing thousands, it set a scale of response that he was unprepared for. Uh, I believe that had they hit higher... The no, hold on, just told, hold on just a second here, Rich. That's an interesting concept. You're saying that had it not been successful, if he hadn't killed as much we would not have escalated this to a world war situation. That's, I, that's, I incredibly, that's, possible. that's incredible. That's possible. Yeah. yeah I, I don't think he was planning for anything this big. Uh, but I also believe that had it hit much higher up, we still would have had the pancake. And, and here's the way it works. I call it the hammer effect. Okay. You put a hammer on your hand, and it weighs maybe a pound, and there's a pound of force. You drop it now from a yard up, uh, three feet up, and it comes down. Uh, and the force is much greater, enormously greater. Uh, the reason is simply that uh, it's it actually, want to know how much greater it is? You take the, the, the ratio of the distance it falls to the distance it stops. If it stops in a tenth of an inch and it falls 20 inches, then it's 200 times the force. That's the hammer effect. Now, imagine that in this building. Suppose you only had one floor above. The, 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 the columns are not super big. They're not designed to hold 100 floors above them. They're designed to hold one floor above them. Remember, they only have a safety factor of two. All right. Now, when those columns collapse from the buckling, this thing comes down basically in free fall. It, 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 remember, you're squeezing the straw, how it collapses right. very suddenly. So now you have the weight of the building not multiplied by a factor of two, but from the hammer effect, it may be a factor of 10 or 20. That will buckle the columns below that. So I think even if it had hit near the top, the whole thing could have gone, simply because these columns are designed to hold up twice as much weight as above them and not more than that. And the hammer effect multiplies that, so, so they would have collapsed anyway. All right, Rich, we've got one more about the buildings. Let's take David on the north side. David, what's your question? Well, with the World Trade Center, considering each one of them had 80,000 gallons of water, which is over a half a million pounds of water for fire prevention and also acting as a counterbalance in the anti-sway uh, device in the upper two floors, that's what brought them down. Remember the white smoke that came out and people said, how come there's white smoke? Well, uh, some of the lines to the water system had been ruptured and it was steam. Oh, there we go. What do you think of that, uh, Rich? I think, I think it's right. I think that's right. And, and that extra weight could cause problems. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying you shouldn't put water in the tops of buildings. As I said, you should not design buildings to, to absorb airplane hits. Uh, that, that just make sure the airplanes don't hit again. I yeah. think, I think, I I think, think that's uh, right. he's, he's right. You can't uh, prevent everything. Let's go to Tim uh, downtown. Hi, Tim. How are you? Doing pretty good, Danny. Have you got a question for the professor? Yes. Um, I've read online that they're developing thorium reactors 
and I don't know if it's uh, you know future technology or has been technology or imaginary technology, but I'd like to see what the professor has to say about what it. What is it, Ethereum or Thorium? Does that thorium. ring a bell with thorium. thorium? And it's very popular in India where they have huge stores of Thorium, and so the Indians in particular are developing these reactors. The way the reactors work is actually you seed them in a uranium reactor and then the thorium gets converted into uranium and that that's what makes the, the reactor go there are some all sorts of claims about thorium reactors most of which i think are exaggerated they claim that they're a lot cheaper than uranium reactors that's not true if thorium is really abundant but we have plenty of uranium and as i pointed out the cost of the uranium is very low they say that you can't make a bomb out of thorium which is true but you can make a bomb out of the uranium that's produced in these reactors it's really not much safer from from proliferation issues they say the nuclear waste is less of a danger well i don't consider the nuclear waste from current reactors to be much of a danger either so these advantages, I think, um, aren't really strong ones. I think that's the reason why India is developing it, but there hasn't been a whole lot of work. There have been some experimental thorium reactors in the United States, but not a whole lot of interest in it because it, the, the reasons just aren't compelling. Rich, do you see us ever being able to harness hydrogen as a fuel? No, and the reason is that we can't mine hydrogen. Hydrogen is no more a fuel than electricity is a fuel. I mean, you make electricity, All right. and then you can transport it on wires across the country. You have to make hydrogen. We make our hydrogen. We don't, you can't mine it, so it's not really a fuel. So it's not transportable then? It is transportable, and it's like charging a battery. Uh, you can charge a battery with electricity, and then you can make the car go. So you could stuff a car with hydrogen. But I think people have lost interest in this once they've realized the problems with doing this. Hydrogen takes up a lot of space. All right. uh, and it's probably much, much better to use natural gas than to use hydrogen. Thanks for being a part of the show with me. My name's Denny Smith. Once a year, I force myself to buy a scientific book. I, uh, I refuse to give up on education. And uh, Pat Sullivan calls me the show nerd on Saturday. And I, I can live with that because you get to learn. Tonight, I have an ask uh, a gentleman who is a physics professor. He's a scientist. He's an author. Uh, he's written the book that I've been reading for the last year or two. It's called Physics for the Future Presidents. And it's a delightful book. Uh, it, it helps you get through all of the science of if you're the president of the United States and somebody comes and says, there's a nuclear device at such and such a place, or we have a nuclear uh, issue at, um, at this reactor or that reactor, or this next problem that I'm going to hit Rich with. Rich, what happens if you're the president of the United States and somebody comes and says, Mr. President, I believe we have the possibility of an anthrax or a smallpox or an Ebola attack on our population? What do, you, what do you do? Well, you know, those three things are all quite different from each other. Okay. Uh, the anthrax is, is a very limited danger. It's like a poison. Uh, if someone gets, breathes in the anthrax, then, then uh, they, if they're not treated, they are likely to die. Or if they're elderly or weak, they're likely to die. Is it contagious? But it's not contagious. All right. That's, that's a key difference. On the other hand, Ebola is enormously contagious. And I, I, I legitimately, I think there's a legitimate concern that a disease like that could make a nuclear apocalypse look, look like nothing. Uh, one point I like to make, just in case there are some terrorists listening to this broadcast, I just want to point out that if a contagious disease is used against the United States, there will be a lot of, of, of sickness and there will be some death. We have some of the best medical care in the world, however, but nothing will stop this disease from spreading around the world. And the terrorists will always be remembered as the people who spread a disease that devastated the developing world, where the real pain, hardship, and death would take place if this ever happens. So I hope if you're a terrorist and you're listening to this, you'll recognize it's not a good way to hurt the United States. Interesting. So what goes around comes around no matter what. Professor, it seems that more wars are fought over energy than are fought over territory. What's the future of energy look like to you right now? Where are we going with, with uh, energy? Well, they're, 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 that's such a complex question. I'm actually in the process of writing a new book on that subject. It's going to be Energy for Future Presidents. It should be out within a year or so. I'll put a lot of thought into it. Um, for the near future, the key in the United States is natural gas. And I just wish more people would recognize that. I think the president knows this. 
Uh, there's a lot of opposition to it right now, but we've discovered enormous natural gas reserves in the United States. They're twice as clean as coal, uh, not as clean as nuclear, but it's, it's, it's a big resource. And for energy security, we really need to start switching to this. We're not going to be driving battery-driven automobiles. We're not going to be driving, in any large extent, hydrogen-driven automobiles. But I really expect we will be driving a lot of natural gas-driven automobiles. So this is the short-term solution. Uh, in terms of, of, um, of, of energy for electricity, uh, I believe that, that There are huge sources of solar and wind that can be exploited. We need to have a much better electrical grid. I'd love to see the United States putting emphasis into making a better electric grid so we can bring uh, the solar and and wind power from the remote locations where it is. Uh, I think nuclear is really safe, and there's this public fear because they don't understand it and because there are fear mongers like, like like, like Senator Reid, who scare people about it, I, I think improperly so. Um, and so there's a, there's a big, big future to that. Uh, our automobiles, um, I, I don't think batteries have a great future. They were just too expensive. Uh, but they, I, I think natural gas uh, works. And we All can right. convert coal into gasoline. And I, I think I expect to see a lot of that happening, too. Rich Muller is joining us here, and I will say this, Rich, that our producer, Danny, said you've got too much common sense to, to come from California. Where are you from? I'm from the Bronx. Yeah, there we go. I, yeah. I can talk like I'm from the Bronx, yeah. but it, it, it drives my wife crazy when I talk like that. I come from the Deep South Bronx. It's the Deep South Bronx. Uh, we're at 143rd Street. Well, how did you end up in California? Well, I, I, I guess I came out to California when I was a junior in college, and uh, decided that it was just so beautiful out here. <laughs> it is beautiful. And the University of California now ranked the top physics university in the world. Uh, is is just a uh, probably because a, a of guys like probably because of guys like you. You make it all yeah, common sense. All right, now I'm going to ask you a question that has been driving anybody who sells a house crazy. In Central Indiana, we are supposedly sitting on a a vein that allows radon gas to come through, and everybody who ever sells a house takes these little canisters, and they put them in three or four different places around the house, and they measure picocuries per liter. Tell me what's going on with radon gas. Are we overreacting? Is it, a, is it, is it truly a risk to all of us with radon? What's your, what's your take on this? Uh, it, it's actually a serious risk. Okay. Uh, ra- radon is the biggest, of all the various sources of radioactivity, including nuclear waste storage, radon leakage is probably the biggest danger around. No kidding. Uh, yeah, it, it, it does leak into homes, particularly homes that are well insulated. They have very little air flowing. It comes in from the cellars. I, I, I do recommend that people uh, have the radon. It's easily handled. Oh, it's sure. As you put eliminated. negative pressure, you put just put Yeah, yeah. You, you, can, you can do it right away. But uh, of the various dangers that take place, this is the one that I, I would consider the most, uh, the most serious. All right. Now, next question. Tell me, well, I tell you what, we've got a caller here. We better get to our caller. We've got Tom on a cell phone. Tom, have you got a, pre- a question for Professor Muller? Yeah, I do. Uh, I'm uh, actually heavily involved in aviation and, and got kind of impacted on the back end of uh, ozone depleting rules. I just wanted to know the professor's take on the uh, ozone holes and if they were naturally occurring. All right. Well, it, let me set this up a little bit, too. I was in the heating and air conditioning business, and we had to start measuring and quantifying an inventory every pound of chlorofluorocarbons that we ever had. It was the biggest nuisance I'd ever had. And I thought they, we were chasing snakes. What, what's the deal with the uh, ozone hole? I think it was a real, real danger. Okay. There is a natural ozone hole. Uh, it is created over the Antarctic, in the Antarctic spring. It grows every year and then decreases. Uh, people were worried about ozone uh, depletion from the use of the CFCs from right. Freon and things like that. I thought and that then, was a bunch of junk. Is that for real? I thought it was, too. Yeah. And then there was a discovery that over the Antarctic, the effect of the Freon was enhanced. It was enhanced through a surprising effect over, the, uh, over Antarctica in the spring. There are little crystals of nitric acid that form. And on these crystals, the, the, the CFCs were far more effective at at destroying ozone. So there is a hole, a larger hole, than there would have been otherwise over the Antarctic. Uh, it's large enough that down in Australia, every year they report how far this hole is going for people who are susceptible to sunburn and such. And there's still a worry down there. That hole was unlikely to spread 
outside of Antarctica up to the north. So that wasn't, that's not the real danger. The danger is simply the fact that it was unexpected. And it shows that we are dumping, that when I was a kid, the solution to pollution was dilution. But now we're learning the Earth is actually a lot smaller than we thought. And the oceans are getting filthy. We are, we can put enough of this freon into the atmosphere that it has big effects over an entire continent of Antarctica. It's not because we know this will spread. What it means is we are putting stuff up there and we don't understand the atmosphere far enough to be really secure that we know what we're doing. There was a survey made of scientists. I'm going to tell you the results of the survey, and I, if I can go back and find it, I will send it to you, because if you're a good scientist, you're going to say, send me the paper. <laughs> they they said, what was the greatest invention of all time? Ah, uh, yes. And, yeah, uh, my favorite was from Freeman Dyson. All right, well, what, but from <laughs> the mechanical... <laughs> he said it was hay? He said it was hay. <laughs> oh, now, see, I heard it was air conditioning. Uh, ah, okay. Because well, it, some, uh, my, 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 my mentor, Louis Alvarez, is, who was somewhat of a libertarian, used to argue that air conditioning was the worst thing that ever happened to the United States. Really? He said without air conditioning, the government would close up during the summer and would actually get some work done. As I said, he's a bit of a libertarian. <laughs> he thought the continued government in Washington, uh, which was made possible by air conditioning, yeah, you're definitely, was a great tragedy. You're definitely from New York. All right. <laughs> Professor Muller, tell me what is antimatter? Uh, antimatter is not something as exotic as you might think. Um, you know, we know particles are made out of protons and electrons, and electrons have negative charge, but it turns out that there can be electrons with positive charge. Uh, that's the big difference. They're just electrons, but they have the opposite charge. That's called antimatter. Is it invisible? Well, no, no more than electrons are invisible. Uh, okay. In fact, bananas emit, anti emit positrons. Uh, a, little, uh, if a banana contains in it potassium. Yes. But we know that. It's a good source of potassium. Right. What, what people don't realize is that potassium is radioactive. Not highly radioactive, but just a little bit radioactive. And when, because it's radioactive... Get out of here. It, You're it, killing it, me now. Uh, well, <laughs> it's, it's an electrolyte. I, okay, so where does it pick up its radioactivity? It had it left over from, from the formation of the solar system. It has a half-life of about a billion years. So it, it's still left over from when it was formed I inside love of a star. I'm eating nuclear f <laughs> You're eating, you're anti eating antimatter. Ah, you're killing because me, Rich. The, positrons, the, the, the bananas, the potassium, emits positive electrons, antimatter. Um, they come out, and uh, you know, antimatter is used in hospitals. The thing about a positive electron is if it hits a negative electron, then they annihilate each other, and all of that energy goes into gamma rays. And so that's why you hear this big deal about antimatter. It's a way of getting rid of all the mass and turning it simply into gamma rays. Is gamma that, ray that's bad? Why, that's why uh, Kirk used antimatter in, 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 in the Starship Enterprise, because you, all of that mass energy gets turned into useful energy, heat energy. We've got ourselves a physicist, folks, and he's a common-sense guy from South Bronx. His name is Rich Muller. He is a uh, professor of physics at the University of California at Berkeley. And he's written a book that I have been reading over the last couple of years called Physics for the Future Presidents. Now, Rich, you've got another one that you've been telling me about that is basically anecdotal with some humor. What's that book? Uh, the book is called The Instant Physicist, and it came out recently. It, it takes some of the uh, best stories from uh, Physics for Future Presidents uh, and some additional ones and illustrates them with some really delightful artwork, uh, cartoons by my artist uh, friend Joey Manfrey. Uh, and in, in 65 Anecdotes, it basically teaches you physics through humor. All right. I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. All right. Now, tell me how night vision... I'm going to give you some rapid-fire questions, because I know I can't keep you forever. How do night vision goggles work? Well, there are three different kinds of night vision goggles. All right. Probably why you're confused. The, the simplest one is simply light enhancers. They're just very sensitive cameras that can detect very small amounts of light and then put them on a TV screen for you to watch. The TV screen is right up by your eyes, so you look like you're looking through binoculars. But they just, they, these are called starlight scopes. Okay. And they were invented in World War II. The next kind uses, a kind uses heat radiation. Now, heat radiation is like visible light. But we can't see it with our eyes. Our eyes aren't sensitive to it. But other than that, it's simply uh, light that's a slightly lower frequency. Than I was just going to say, light. now, that, that's what you call low-frequency IR? It's called infrared light. Infrared. Uh, low uh, infrared light. Right. And so for, the, for, for these scopes, what they do is they will have an infrared flashlight. And they'll shine this on a scene. I have one on my granddaughter. 
It's a little infrared light. It shines on your crib. And then we have a little infrared camera. My eye doesn't sense the infrared light, but the camera does. And it puts it on a little TV screen. So when she's sleeping there and she wakes up in the middle of the night and she cries for a moment, I can look when I'm babysitting at this little camera without having to go in there and see, well, is she really in, in, in distress or is she simply uh, uh, turning over? <laughs> does infrared so, hurt us in any way? No, no, no. We get lots of infrared from the sky all the time. We just don't see it. Snakes detect it. That's how they go for prey. In oh, the, the pit night. vipers. The pit viper, right. Right. And mosquitoes can detect it, too. That's how they, they, they're attracted not only by moisture and other things, but also by the warmth of your body. So we sometimes call this heat radiation. All right. Now, now what, about, a, what about the higher frequency uh, infrared? Okay, the, the, the third kind of infrared, which is the, 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 the uh, very, actually very low frequency infrared, is the light that we just emit. Just like an ordinary incandescent light bulb emits light because it's hot. The sun emits light because it's hot. Okay. We emit light, but it's an invisible light. It's, it's called the far infrared, and you could build a scope that sees this. All and right. So then you, then this is what our soldiers use. When, when, when our army says, we own the night, they mean it because they can wear these scopes, and they don't have to carry flashlights. And they can, this is when, we, when we were looking for Osama bin Laden uh, in, this, in the hills of Tora Bora, uh, you just look down with one of these scopes, and you could see what areas are warm. You could see which caves were warmer than other caves. Oh, those are the predator drones that that yeah, are going. The predator to... drones have this, so you can det- you can I I can have one of these things, and I can go out at night and I can tell which automobile recently was running because it's warmer. We I, I I one time saw this when I was on the border of Mexico, and I was with the border patrol, and we went out there, and as as the as the illegal immigrants came over the hills, we could see them glowing. Uh, coming over the hill. And it was pitch black. It was absolutely pitch black. So, so this is the most advanced of the technologies, but it really works. It enables you to see in the utter darkness using simply the ordinary infrared radiation that we all emit because of the fact that we're warm. All right. This is uh, Rich Muller, who has written a book, Physics for Future Presidents. He has uh, a wealth of knowledge in this book that I've been reading for the last couple of years. All right. Next question. Professor, this last weekend here in Indianapolis, we had a flyover just before the Indianapolis Motor Speedway started the 500-mile race. In the air above us was the most amazing machine I've ever seen. It was a B-2 stealth bomber. How in the world does that stealth bomber evade radar? What, I've heard that it, that it absorbs it. How does it, get, how does it you know, evade it? The biggest effect is that it, it, the surface is most, it does absorb some, but the biggest effect is it's like a mirror. Now, what people don't appreciate is that most radars can only detect the radio waves that are bounced right back at them. If you build a, 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 a bomber that has surfaces that deflect the light away from the original emitter, then it, it, they don't see it. It's something like the Hall of Mirrors. It's easy to hide in a Hall of Mirrors behind a mirror because none, none of the light comes the right way. So uh, all of those angular surfaces, there's no flush surface. So as the, as the, the wave hits trick. it, it bounces it up or, or bounces it down or away. That's exactly right. That's the biggest effect. Now, they do. there always are some surfaces that face forward, like the tips of the wing. Right. And a big problem is always the cockpit. There are other issues in stealth, too. It's not just radar, but people pick up the heat signatures. So they worry a lot about that, too. But the biggest effect is that they design the surface so that the radar does not get deflected back at the radar emitter. All right. Next question. How, what is fallout? How long does fallout last? Fallout is debris from the nuclear bomb that uh, the worst parts of the fall- for a really big nuclear bomb. There was not much fallout at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. A small bomb doesn't have much fallout. We worried about fallout in, mostly in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, because a big thermonuclear bomb produces a huge amount of debris that's radioactive. The worst parts of it, cesium, strontium-90, radioactive for 20, 30, 40 years. Now, that's the and stuff that comes up in the mushroom cloud itself? Yes. Okay. Yes. And it, the reason it's called fallout is um, it, it, the worst thing that can happen is for it to rain. Uh, most of that radioactivity, stays, if it stays up in the atmosphere, it decays away. Uh, but the stuff that comes down, that falls out, if, if it has a lot of dirt mixed in with it, then it tends to come down to the ground. And calculations show that for a really big thermonuclear bomb, that could call, kill more people than the explosion itself. Wow. All right. What is critical mass? The way a nuclear bomb works is you get enough of it together 
so that the chain reaction can't escape. Now, the chain reaction occurs when you have one nucleus blow itself apart, and the neutrons that come out hit another one. If they leak out, it doesn't happen. So you need a minimum amount of material. That's called the critical mass. The way a bomb works is uh, the, the way the Hiroshima bomb works is they have two pieces of uranium, purified uranium, especially uranium-235. They just slam them together. Uh, the individual pieces were small enough that neutrons would leak out. When they slammed them together, then for a millionth of a second, those neutrons couldn't leak out. They, they created a... Uh, an avalanche effect, and so most of it most of it exploded. So critical mass for uranium is, is probably about 10 pounds, something like that. All right. Uh, last question before I turn you loose. Talk to me about the sun. The sun is a, you know, my brother-in-law is a dermatologist, and he's always telling me how much uh, damage the sun can do to our skin over time. But then I hear stories about other things that can harm us that come from the sun. Talk to me about solar flares and solar eruptions, uh, these electromagnetic waves. What should we expect from uh, from sun problems besides the uh, skin cancers? Oh, I, I think if you're on the ground, the skin cancer is really the only issue. The solar flares have the capability of disrupting our communications. If they're really big, there are some people who are worried that a really big solar flare could actually disrupt our power lines. Uh, that they could induce enough of an electrical jolt in those. Uh, but all the results would be indirect. The, the, the real worry, your brother-in-law is right, it's really, it's, it's really getting sunburned. That's what you want to avoid. That's right. the biggest danger. Well, Rich Muller, you've kept your, your part of the bargain. I'm sorry I stood you up last week, but by golly, you have delivered here for the last 90 minutes. If people would like to learn more uh, about the stuff you write or find you, what's the best way for them to learn more about Rich Muller? Well, I, I think the first step would be to get a copy of, of my book, The Physics for Future Presidents. It's, I think it's like Which is a great book. Uh, and, and you might, you might uh, look on YouTube. Uh, most, all my lectures for 2006 uh, in my physics course have been put on YouTube. Um, and they've been watched now, I know, because people emailed me from over 90 countries around the world. So they're, they're, they were ranked one of the most popular of all the lectures. I think they came in number three in a New York Times survey. So just look up Physics for Future Presidents on YouTube, and you can watch me lecture. Oh, you can be so proud of that. Well, thanks for sharing your time, your talents, your knowledge. Uh, I tell you what, I'm going to call you back because I've still got two pages of questions we didn't get to. So <laughs> I hope you will never run out of questions. Oh, I will never will. Hey, thank you so much for your time, sir. You're welcome. It's been a pleasure. You take care. 